starting a new teaching series uh, today. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be a little different um, for us as we walk through this. Um, but the, the teaching series is called this, The Bible Doesn't Say That. And um, we are, uh, we're, we're in... Even just in a uh, in a normal season of life, um, there's there's a lot of just misinformation and and half truths that that flow out and are floating all around us and and things that we hear. But especially now in this season, um, it can just kind of be overwhelming. Um, all of the stuff that's coming at us and perspectives and trying to discern what's fact and and what's opinion um, and and even even numbers that we, we tend to always think numbers are factual. We're, we're seeing even how numbers can be used to you know to to push forward a certain uh, agenda or perspective, and so. Um, it's 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 a difficult season, and so uh, it, it's essential for us um, as the church, as followers of Jesus, in a season like this, but really just in daily life, uh, to make sure that we are um, looking at things not from a certain preference or even a political preference, but that we are looking at things from a, from a biblical centered worldview. And, um, and and this again doesn't just go for this season of life. This this ripples into just normal seasons of life, whenever whatever normal looks like, and we get back to that, um, it's going to be very important that um, that we we pay attention uh, to the things that we're embracing, the things that we're grabbing onto, because because sometimes there are things that get floated out to us um, that sound really good. They maybe even sound like spiritual truths, um, but when we look at them compared to Scripture, we'll actually see that the Bible doesn't actually say those things. And if we follow those and, and look to work those into our lives, then um, we actually end up just kind of taking a little bit of a truth and, um, and, and pushing that um, uh, into our lives. And then we see that it just doesn't really work. So, um, so for the next few weeks, we're going to unpack some of these common phrases that you've maybe heard along the way. And we want to look at those from a correct, biblical, Jesus-centered perspective. And uh, we're going we're gonna to jump into those. Because here's what happens. Um, with every lie that comes up, um, there's, there's just enough there to make it sound Correct. I mean, you go back and you look at scripture um, and, and, and Satan, our enemy, he's the master at this. Um, he started in the garden with Adam and Eve. He took just enough of kind of what God said to, to create some confusion. I mean, you look at Jesus and even his temptation before his ministry began. We see early on he's, he's, he's out and, he, and he's away and, and then Satan shows up and, and tempts him. And, and there's just enough of something that sounds truthful to try to distort what's real. And, and the thing is, Satan knows God's word. Like he knows it. So he knows how to take it. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't like it. He doesn't follow it, but he takes just enough of it to twist it and, and kind of make it sound true and, and make it feel good sometimes if we're honest. And, um, and, and the difficulty is this, if you and I are honest, um, Sometimes we're, we're more familiar with our friends' social media statuses than we are with God's stance and God's perspective on certain things. So when Satan comes along with this thing that kind of sounds good, tickles our ears a little bit, we think it's spiritual and biblical, but it's really not. And we try to work that in our life. It just creates all kinds of confusion. So uh, we, want, we want to help you kind of think through how you're navigating through this season and really challenge you to embrace your identity in Christ, take on a biblical Jesus-centered worldview. And, um, and, and Ephesians, I love what's said in Ephesians 6, um, 16 through 18. Um, check this scripture out. It says, it says, in all circumstances, Circumstances take up the shield of faith. Now, no, notice this word "all" here. Um, so, so that would include this season that we're in right now. Um, not some circumstances, but all of our circumstances. Um, take up the shield of faith. So, faith is a component to this. We've got to actually believe what Jesus has said. Um, so, the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. He's trying to throw all things at us, uh, all kinds of things at us to to distract us from the truth of God's word. So verse 17 says, so we have to take the helmet of his salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We want to make sure we're taking God's word, handling that correctly, and then praying at all times in the spirit. So we want to focus on moving with faith, 
But that faith has to come from a place of being rooted in God's word and, and being led by the Holy Spirit through prayer. So here's the phrase that I want to unpack for us today that we're going to look at and we're going to, we're going to kind of dive into. Um, a phrase that we commonly hear is this, and this is, the, this is what we're going to jump into, is this. Is that God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. Now, that's, that's marked out because what you'll actually find is, the, is that the Bible doesn't actually say that anywhere. Um, but that's a phrase that we've heard quite a bit. Some people will actually say that this, this is probably the most often quoted phrase as if it's in the Bible, but it's actually not in the Bible. Um, this saying actually, so where does this saying come from? Uh, well, it's, it's typically attributed back to Benjamin Franklin of of all people. Um, he quoted it in the Poor Richard's Almanac in 1757. Um, it, it's shown up in some other areas along the ways, but even in other religions, there's there's variations of this statement. In, in the Quran, uh, 1311, it says, Indeed, Allah will not change the conditions of a population until they change what is in themselves. And, and essentially, it has a little different meaning, but it's implying that helping oneself is a prerequisite to getting the help of God. That's that's what that's what they say even trace this statement back to greek philosophy around 400 bc it was said that and heaven never helps the men who will not act and so there's this idea there that god helps those who help themselves in other words that if we are doing what we need to do then god's going to jump in and help us and, and we even can look at scripture and there, there's a little bit of a sprinkling of truth maybe dropped into this statement that's just enough there. And you can even see glimpses of this in scripture that could confuse us. Look, for example, at Proverbs 13, 4. It says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Deuteronomy 28, 8 says, the Lord will command the blessing on you and your barns and, and in all that you undertake. You could look at these verses and you could say, well, see, doesn't the Bible kind of say that God helps those who help themselves? Well, here, here's the issue. When you look at this statement or any, any of the others that we'll look at, is the, the issue is, is with the consistent character of God that ranges all throughout the whole council of scripture compared to a, a verse or two here or there that's maybe pulled out of context. And that's what we have to be careful of. And that's what we want to focus on is the whole council of scripture. So if this statement, God helps those who help themselves, if this is not a true statement, well, then what do we take away from this? So I want to ask a question to kind of shift us to unpack this. And here's the question I want you to think about. Instead of saying God helps those who help themselves, let's think about this today. What makes God decide to respond? Let's think about this. What makes God decide to respond? Is, is it because you and I help ourselves, and that somehow then motivates God to want to jump in and, and help us? Um, does God just look at us and say, well, they're trying really, really hard, so, so I'm going to show up and help them. Look, you and I know that that saying, God helps those who help themselves, we know just reality, like that, that's not how it plays out. I mean, if you ever, maybe this is even you, you try to work through a situation with integrity, maybe some of you even watching this right now. You navigate through your job, trying to work with integrity, and then what happens? Circumstances out of your control, you get laid off. Is this God doing this? Isn't God supposed to help those who help themselves? Or it's those thoughts that come to our mind. What about the person who does everything for everybody, only to have something really bad happen to them? Things get stolen, they get robbed, they get taken advantage of. See, we know that this statement does not play out in real life. Maybe even feeling some of that right now. I mean, people stepping back and saying, I was trying to do everything I can. Where is God in the midst of all this? Why isn't he showing up and helping me out? Like we know that bad things can happen to good people. And that doesn't mean that God has disappeared or that God's not present. But the core of this statement um, that God helps those who help themselves at the core of that statement is this self-centeredness. It's this idea that I really have the power to move and make God respond. That's why I ask you the question, what makes God decide to respond? Um, and, and I just want to say this before we start unpacking this question, look, God has everything that you need. 
any, any bit of help or strength or provision or resources or whatever it is, God has everything that you need. And I want you to know that and I want you to believe that. I think scripture shows us that. And I don't want you to doubt that for a moment. But you trying hard and trying harder and trying harder and trying to help yourself and come up with everything that you, everything that you can, like that, that's not going to motivate and make God respond. So what makes God respond? This is the question we're going to unpack. And let's look at how this statement just doesn't really work. And let's, let's use some scripture to help us gain a better understanding of how God works. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 31, starting out. So we look here in verse 25, and it says, Therefore... Now, we know that anytime we see a therefore, we actually need to back up. So before we unpack 25, we're going to back up to verse 24. Um, So Paul said, or, uh, or, or Matthew's writing this says, therefore, let's back up to verse 24. And in verse 24, you see this. It says, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Look at what it says. You cannot serve God and money. Now, money may not be the issue for you right here, but here's what happens. Here's what shows up is, is we go about our lives. We're thinking about how am I going to make all this work? And, and we can either be driven by God and his hand on our life or money, or maybe it's not money for you. Maybe it's, maybe it's your, your social media status. Maybe it's your job position, your job title. Maybe it's performance recognition. Maybe it's political preference. I don't know what it is, but Jesus is saying here, you can, you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and fill in the blank. There can't be anything else that's there. Anything else that we think is going to motivate God is just not going to work. We can't be split in our allegiance. So he says this, and then we get to verse 25, and he says, therefore, and he wants to talk to us about being anxious, about worrying, about trying to help ourselves. He says this, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, they neither toil nor, nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more, much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we want? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? And when you look at this statement, we come back and we ask this question, what makes God decide to respond? When we look at our situations, we look at what we're going through, what is it that makes God respond? I think what Jesus is trying to say to us right here is this, is that our our anxiety doesn't force God's hand. Our anxiety doesn't force God. God's hand. And, and we, we look at this text and, and what we actually see is that our anxiety will actually mess us up. So, so what is it? God, God doesn't help those who help themselves. Um, what is it that makes God decide to respond? Well, let's look at a couple of things. It's not, first, it's not our anxiety. Our anxiety, your nervousness, your worrying, your anxiety, those things don't force God's hand. And here's what happens is when we feel as if things aren't happening, when we feel as if, if whatever we've tried to tack along, uh, alongside God isn't working, we, we, we wonder, well, isn't God going to, I'm trying really hard, isn't God going to swoop in and save the day and, and help me out in this? And then when that doesn't happen like that, we kind of step back and we, we begin to worry. We begin to be anxious. We feel as if God is gone or he's distant or he's maybe just doesn't even care. See, what's actually happening, though, in those moments is, is that we're, we're seeing that our identity is being hit. We had this idea that we could hold it all together. We could help ourselves and God would jump in and help us too. And that's not playing out. And, 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 and we feel as if our identity, almost the core of who we are, is sometimes being attacked. Uh, Let me say this about anxiety right along that, because our anxiety doesn't force God's hand. But here's the other thing that we see is that anxiety always reveals a part of our identity that's fear-based. Catch that. 
Our, our anxiety always reveals a part of our identity that's fear-based. There's, there's things in all of us that cause us to get nervous, that cause us to get anxious, and we actually have learned to respond to try to help ourselves cope with that. But we're doing that because we're actually afraid of something. See, that anxiety kicks in and it, it's rooted in some kind of fear that's there. We all get anxious about things, kind of on a shallow level. Um, I've, I've shared how I get very anxious and nervous anytime that I'm asked around our house to do any kind of handyman work. I don't get asked very often because it doesn't usually play out very well. But a couple of weeks ago, we had bought this door we were going to put to go out on our deck um, so the dog could go in and out of it and we weren't constantly opening the main door to go out on the deck. And, um, and, and Jennifer asked me, she's like, do you want to try to put the door up? And I was just like, who are you talking to? Like, I know you're not talking to me. And she's like, yeah, you want to try to put the door up? I'm like, well, first of all, I'm shocked you're actually going to allow me to try because I usually mess everything up. But then I was a little overwhelmed with all this anxiety because I have this fear of just, and it's fear rooted in past experiences, that I mess things up when I try to do things like this. So I had all these thoughts about like, I'm going to have to get this door up and something's going to go wrong and I'm going to have to call my father-in-law or my dad to come bail me out of this half hung door that's on the side of my house now, or, or I'm going to drill a hole and I'm going to put the hole in the wrong place. And then every time anybody looks at that door, they're going to see that hole that Josh put in the door. It was, so I was flooded with all these thoughts and this anxiety. Well, long story short, we, we, I, we pushed through and with a lot of help from Jennifer, I was able to get the, got the door up and here we are two weeks later and the door is still working just fine. And there's no weird, obvious holes there. But all that to say is sometimes we, we, we don't really realize things that are in our identity that are fear-based um, and, and, until we're like confronted with it. And, and then when that anxiety gives evidence to it that there's parts of that that's fear-based. And, and what we do is we expect God just to, just to help us in the way that we're trying to help ourselves work through things. And it just doesn't always play out like that. And, and essentially, this is what happens. This is, is another thought right here is that anxiety kicks in when we are focused on our performance. Did you catch that? Anxiety kicks in when we're focused on our performance. You see at the core of that statement that God helps those who help themselves, it's all about our performance. It's all about what are we going to do to fix it, and then let's hope God jumps in and helps us out. But that's not exactly how this is supposed to play out. It's not our anxiety that's going to force God's hand. You see, your identity, my identity can't be wrapped up in the thought that us doing certain things is going to produce a certain amount of positioning or response from God. So I don't know about you, but here's what happens for me in life. When, when I end up trying to help myself in something and figure out how to do it myself, I actually end up doing it all by myself. And, and what I realize is that the reason I'm in a mess in the first place is because I was already trying to do it myself. So when I'm trying to get out of it by doing it all myself, I'm not helping myself. I'm just making a bigger mess. You see this overarching idea of God helps those who help themselves. See, honestly, the Bible just completely demolishes that and, and, but doesn't want us to live in this anxious, worried place because we're not able to help ourselves. That's, that's not the intent because there's actually hope for us. Look at what Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. See that? See, the, the message of the gospel is that this is not about our doing. It is the gift of God. It's not the result of works. God doesn't swoop in and help us because we first helped ourselves. That's not, that's not how this works. So when we get anxious, when we get worried, it's, it's not about those things. It says that, it says it's the gift of God, not, not of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let me ask you this question. In what ways do you feel anxious right now? In what ways do you feel anxious right now? Your tendency in the mix of that anxiety is going to be to probably jump in and try to help yourself and hope God swoops in and helps you too. But that's not how God gets motivated to respond. You see, we shouldn't approach God for validation, hoping that he'll see our efforts and then decide to jump in and help us. What we should do is approach God for inspiration, 
coming before God open-handed, saying, God, I need you. I need your plans. I need your vision. I need your intervention. Would you inspire me and show me how you want to move in the midst of this? Instead of worrying and being anxious, I say we need to just talk to God about it. Let's just get his inspiration about it. You might hear that and you may say, wow, that's just weird. I don't know if that's how I want to feel with, deal with how I feel anxious right now. Like, and I'm talking about really talk to God, like get away and talk to God, like out loud, have a conversation. And I get it. You might think that's weird. But let me ask you this. Would you rather do something that feels a little weird, but actually works or just simply live in a place of worry? In what ways do you feel anxious right now? Our anxiety is not going to force the hand of God, but it can move us if we'll allow it to sit at the feet of God. So let's look on Matthew 6, 32. So after Jesus unpacks these things about, about worry, he says this in verse 32. He says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. And get this, your heavenly father knows that you need them all. He knows it. He knows that you need these things everyone has needs, you have needs, I have needs, and God knows that. In the midst of these circumstances right now, God, you have needs and God knows that. What makes God decide to respond? Well, we've talked about how it's not your anxiety that forces his hand. But here's the other thing, just simply having needs doesn't necessarily make God respond. Having needs doesn't necessarily force God's hands. You see, you look back at the context here, the Gentiles, uh, that's, that's essentially a reference to all the people who weren't necessarily following God. They weren't of his chosen crowd. And it says that the Gentiles seek after all these things. So it's saying that whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, whether you believe in God or not, uh, we all have these essential things that we worry about, that we stress about, and we try to help ourselves with. We try to make it happen and hope that God swoops in and blesses it. But here's the difference. All these other people that don't have God, they, they really are kind of on their own. They're going through things on their own. But here's the deal. You go back and you look at verse 32. It says, and your heavenly father, knows that you need them. It gets really personal right there. You see, if you're watching this and you're a follower of Jesus, your heavenly father knows what you need, but it's not just simply you having a need that's going to force God's hand, that's going to lead him to swoop in and jump in and help. But he does know what you need. And while others may walk around feeling as if the weight of the world is on their shoulders, you as a follower of Christ you shouldn't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. You should just be resting in the one who created the world, who holds all things together in his hands. So you have a heavenly father that wants to help you, but he's not going to just simply do it because you're trying to help yourself. That's not what motivates God to respond. It's not just us being in need that motivates God to respond. Let me ask you this. You think about your heavenly father and him just wanting you to come to him. I ask you this question. How often are you having time with your heavenly father? How often are you having time with your heavenly father? And I ask that because of this. There, there's a direct connection, I think, between the amount of time you spend in prayer and your anxiety level. The amount of time in prayer is connected to your anxiety level. You see, you have a heavenly father that already knows your situation. He already knows what's going on. And just simply you having a need is not going to be why God swoops in. But I will say this, as you seek his face in prayer, you'll see a difference in your anxiety level. God doesn't just help those who are helping themselves. I mean, think about this. Um, Think, just think, think about a relationship maybe that you had with a, with a parent or someone close to you. I know um, my kids, as maybe yours has done too over the years, um, they'd love it when I put them on my shoulders. And um, it, it was a lot of fun when they were little. Now, as they get bigger, it's a lot harder to do that. I can't do that as long. One of my kids, I, I can't even really do it anymore. And it's kind of sad. I miss those days. But when I would put them on my shoulders, they felt tall. Now they, they, would, they would say things about like, is this what it's like to be an NBA player or something like that? Because they could see life, they could see everything around them with a whole different perspective. Their perspective changed when they were on their dad's shoulders. When it comes to you navigating through life, the things that maybe make you anxious, that make you worry, things that you're trying to help yourself work through, there is no greater perspective than you taking on the perspective of your heavenly father. 
And he wants to give that to you. And how often are you coming before him in a time of prayer so that your anxiety level can be reduced? Because that's what God will do for you. So we think about this. God doesn't simply just help those who help themselves. So what is it? What is it? We've been asking this question. What makes God respond? If it's not our anxiety, if it's not just us being in need, what is it that makes God respond? Well, I think the answer lies in verse 33. It says this. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, here's what I want you to make sure that you get. Because this statement, God helps those who help themselves, we've pretty much established that's not true. So what makes God decide to respond? I think we could say it like this. God responds out of his character. So there's a consistent character about God and who he is that we discover as we spend time with him and, 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 and spend time in scripture. God responds out of his character according to his kingdom for those who seek him. What makes God decide to respond? Well, he's going to respond out of his character. He's going to respond out of who he is. And, and, and the way that he responds in his character is going to be according to his kingdom, according to his plans, according to his agenda, to what he has going on. And he's going to respond for those who seek him. God is for you. He is not against you. So when we say God doesn't just jump in and help those who are helping themselves, that doesn't mean that God's against you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to help you. That's, that's not even what that means. It just means that it, th this has to happen in the context of a relationship where he is the centerpiece, not our efforts to help ourselves. See, in verse 33, it says, these things will be added to you. God will respond He's going to do that out of his character, according to his kingdom, and for those who seek him. And for you and I, it might take some adjustments for us to understand exactly how God is going to help us. Because it might look different than what we thought it would be. It might require the removal of some things from our lives that maybe we thought were essential. But there's a promise here, and the promise here in verse 33, that if we will seek first the kingdom of God, seek his righteousness, seek his character, seek his way, seek his kingdom, he says, I'll respond. He says, I will help you. But this idea of just because you're trying really hard, God's going to swoop in and help, that's not how this plays out. There's actually a, a humility here that God's looking for that leads to him responding. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here's the truth. I'll end with these last two thoughts. Because God doesn't just simply help those who help themselves. We see that God responds according to his character and his kingdom and toward those who seek him out. Here's two thoughts. Because God does help us. Thank goodness, right? God does help us. But let's reset our thinking in this. Think about it like this. Here's the first one. God helps those who can't help themselves. See, God helps those who can't help themselves. Romans 5, 6 through 8, look at what this says. It says, for while we were still, what? Weak. At the right time, Christ died for us. For, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even die. But look at what it says here in verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, when you and I were helpless, when we couldn't even help ourselves to even get back to God, God showed up and he says, I will help you. We see the truth in scripture is not that God helps those who helps themselves. It's that God helps those who can't help themselves. That's the good news of the gospel is that it's not our anxiety that forces God's hand. It's not us being in need that just simply forces God's hand. It's that we can't help ourselves in the midst of our needs. And when we recognize that, God jumps in and he helps us. God helps us when we're utterly helpless. And honestly, this is the difference between what we believe as, as the church, as, as, as Christians, this is, the, this is the game changer between what we believe in all other religions. You see, other religions are about how you help yourself get to God, and then God swoops in. What we believe is that there's nothing we could do to earn God's love or to help ourselves get to him. So Jesus came, did all the work, and he swooped in and helped us because we can't help ourselves. 
But in in the midst of God helping us in that way, here's the other, here's the here's the last thing that I'll point to is that God helps those who seek to help others. See, God's not just all about swooping in and helping people because they're trying hard and trying to help themselves. God helps those who seek to help others. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 3. He says, but when, look at this, not if, but when, right? When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. There's this assumption that if we believe in him, we will look to help others. And God is looking to empower you in that. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. How does God respond? How does God show up? We said it's about his kingdom. He responds out of his character. He responds to those who seek him. But get this, here's how God responds. He responds through you. He responds through me. He responds through his church, through his people. That's how the help shows up. And in this season, there are great opportunities for us, not just to sit back and say, well, God's going to help those who are trying to help themselves and he's not going to help those who aren't trying to help themselves. That's, that's a crazy perspective for us to have in this season. Instead, we have been called and challenged to rise up as his church. And God is looking to help those who are willing to help others. What you have in your life is not just for you because you've helped yourself get there. What you have is there for you to actually help others in the power and the spirit of the resurrection. You are empowered. So you see, it's not so much about us seeking him so that he will just simply respond for us. It goes way beyond that. So I want to ask you a question. We've kind of blown up this idea of God helping those who help themselves. We've talked about um, what, what is it, what, what determines, what, what leads to God responding. Um, we've unpacked these things. Let me, let me end with this. And I want you to think about how you need to unpack this and think about this and how you come before God this week. One of two ways. It's this. Do you need to come before God saying, God, I can't help myself. I know that you want to help me. And, and I'm not going to try to help myself through this because I know the best response for me is just to come before you and say, God, I can't help myself in this. I need you. That's what God's looking for. So is this you? I can't help myself. Coming before God, just confessing that. Maybe there's an area in your life, in your marriage, in a relationship, a job situation, provisions you're looking for, resources you're looking for, a relationship with your kids, where you just need to come before God and say, God, I can't help myself in this. I need you. Or, or maybe this week, you need to talk to God about this. He says, help me help others. God, I need your help. I want to be a blessing. I want to help. I want to be your church right now, God. I need your help, God, to help me help others. Which way does this hit you? How's God leaning into this? As we've blown up this idea that to this morning, that God helps those who help themselves. So let's pray, and then um, I want to share one last thing with you really quick. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for being with us. We thank you that your willingness to help us is not dependent really um, on us helping ourselves, because we are helpless without you. So God, just continue to invite us to know you. Invite us into a relationship with you. Um, we thank you that you have done that. I pray that as people hear this, that they'll be, God, we'll just digest this. We'll, we'll think about how we are trying to work in our own strength and how that's just— it just causes anxiety and stress. So God, speak to us, remind us. God, as, as many of us will jump into our ST groups coming out of this, I just pray, God, that we will we'll, we'll be open and honest with each other about the ways that we've tried to just make this work. God, but we just, we need you. We need you, God. And we thank you that we can rest in our identity in you. Speak to us, lead us, guide us, God, as we step into this week. We want to be faithful. We want to be willing to help others, God, as we live, work, and play. Lead us into that. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.